First, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been here at the Dakota that's come this morning to our uh, cow-calf series called the Dakota Cow-Calf Clinics. Today's session is uh, cover crops and cattle. We do have another session that's going to be on Wednesday, February 16th, and that's beef cattle, and it's going to cover beef cattle reproduction. Today's uh, conference is located, as we said, in multiple sites across the state of North Dakota, and uh, uh, it's basically the eastern part of the state with guest speakers coming from both uh, Carrington here and Bontonneau as well as Fargo and Bismarck are going to be joining us. Our topic for today as we looked at was cover crops and how they interact with cattle. And we're going to start off the morning with our uh, county extension agent up in Bontonneau County, Tim Semler, and he's going to present to us cover crops, value, and cost. I believe that's right, Tim, if that's the case. Uh, or uh, please uh, continue on and... Uh, let us know if things don't work, everybody. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Carl, and, and good morning. Is my sound coming o coming through okay at all at all points here? It's fine at Carrington. Oh, well, okay, fine. good. Uh, what we're going to do this morning um, is uh, I'm going to uh, walk through uh, uh, a little bit of things that happened here in Bonnet County uh, over the course of this last year. And I've got this uh, PowerPoint here on soil health, uh, cover crops, and relay cropping, and I'm only going to go part ways through that uh, because I'm going to stop at the Carrington data because I'm sure Ezra will be covering, covering that uh, in her presentation. Uh, I also have uh, the cover crops chart to uh, demonstrate. Um, so for those of you at the host sites, uh, you'll want to have both my PowerPoint and the cover crops chart uh, up and ready to go. And I'm going to go through slide nine on the regular screen with PowerPoints uh, and then minimize that and then just demonstrate that cover crop chart and then we'll go back and then we'll uh, we'll go to the whole screen with uh, starting with the pictures of the cover crops that we saw around the county. So with that we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, go to slide two here. Um, this presentation started out uh, visiting with crop producers and you know why would you grow a cover crop if you aren't a livestock producer and in, uh, in central North Dakota, most livestock producers are, are diversified, so I think uh, this applies to uh, quite a few people. Uh, this past year and, and uh, some of these wet years, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of prevented planting or sizable wet areas in the fields. And um, a reason for growing cover crops on, on these wet areas or even dedicating fields to it is that uh, if we have plant growth on there versus uh, idled fallow land, uh, you have... Uh, uh, healthy soil organisms keeping the soil active and healthy throughout the uh, uh, growing season of the year. And uh, if we don't, if we idle this acreage uh, or if we spray down even the weeds on it, uh, we have the organisms like rhizobia and mycorrhizae that will go to sleep. And of course, uh, those are some of the major ones. There's many, many, many more in the soil that uh, keep things going and active throughout the year. Rhizobia, of course, is the bacteria that works with legumes to fix nitrogen in the soil. If we can keep those going, uh, so much the better. And then the mycorrhizae are, is a fungus in the soil that interacts with plant roots to liberate uh, phosphorus in the soil. So uh, it's a win-win situation by keeping some plant growth growing in those fields, even if we have uh, failed or wet acres. Uh, another reason, of course, would be in these excessively wet years to use, utilize excessive moisture. Uh, if we use up that topsoil moisture, uh, additional rains fall in, uh, leaches down the salts uh, deeper into the soil profile, and we do have predominantly kind of calcium salt uh, type soils in the state that will create problems under these wet years. Uh, under cover crops, of course, if we have legumes growing in that acreage, we'll fix nitrogen in the soil, and that's a benefit to the crop the next year. More uh, advantages to co growing cover crops. If we gr choose a taprooted cover crop, uh, we can bring deeper soil nutrients closer to the soil surface. A major one of those would be uh, uh, sulfur, but also we could uh, see uh, potassium and, and phosphorus increase by growing some of these deep ta uh, taproted crops, and we'll take a look at some of those on the cover crop chart. Uh, we can also break up clay pans uh, by having those uh, deep taprooted uh, cover crops growing, and uh, we've actually seen some uh, results where they will do that. We can uh, improve soil organic matter content which is always a plus. Uh, Dave will kind of cover that a little bit more in his presentation, but uh, if we have uh, cover crops that have a, uh, a you know, optimal uh, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, that 
also helps uh, you know fix nitrogen in the soil and, and liberate uh, our nutrients in the soil. And of course, if we're a livestock producer, we can provide high quality late season grazing for uh, cattle, sheep, uh, any livestock that will utilize uh, forage. You know, and basically, in choosing a cover crop or thinking about implementing this on your operation, you know, what are your goals for a cover crop? What are some of the negatives on uh, cover crops? Uh, certain seed mixes can use up existing fertility. You know, is that a good trade off? So, if we think about the cover crops that we grow, such as uh, uh, the grassy type. Uh, crops, uh, you know, the sedan grasses, the millets, uh, maybe oats, maybe barley, uh, those will utilize nitrogen, but if you're utilizing excess moisture and uh, getting those salts to leach down, maybe it's a good trade-off for that particular year. Another thing to think about is crop insurance limitation. There is a difference between uh, prevented planting and failed acres and how you can utilize those acres. In the case of prevented planting, you cannot harvest or graze uh, those crops after November 1st. Well, we all know that uh, in this particular part of the world that uh, November 1st it can be pretty touch and go whether or not we have a snow cover and can utilize those crops. So I think maybe that needs to be worked on a little bit by producers uh, through their insurance companies to see if they can't get that liberated a little bit. Uh, in the case of failed acres where you planted a crop and it flooded out and then you seed in the middle of the summer, actually uh, there are less restrictions on those so you can utilize those earlier than November 1st. Uh, also, the cover crop choice affects the residue left in the field next spring. You know, do you have a strictly no-till operation or do you have uh, somewhat of a uh, reduced till operation or conventional till? All of those uh, factors enter into your decision whether or not to grow a cover crop and, and or the choices that you would uh, take in, in putting a cover crop on those acres. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the seed costs involved? Uh, in the handout that I gave uh, all of the sites, uh, uh, this is just simply some of the costs that I found for some of the um, major crops that are probably used uh, by people uh, experimenting with cover crops. So uh, it varies, but this, these are the numbers that I put together. And uh, the main uh, idea here would be to shop around. You can find large variations in the costs of the different cover crops that you might choose, as well as uh, the quality. So make sure you ask questions of the, uh, the seed dealers after you've researched the subject and decide what you want to go with. Uh, not just any radish will do. If you want a, a large tap-rooted uh, radish, you have to get uh, the radish hybrids of the Pasha. Uh, so to make sure that, that you get those. Uh, you can also buy just plain radish seed that would be similar to the garden radishes that you grow. So ask some questions of the seed dealer before you commit to buying that. Okay, uh, what would be some cover crop considerations? You know, what are, what's the reason you're going to grow the cover crop out there? You know, what's the cost? Uh, are you going to mix your own seed? It's, it's a good use of leftover seed uh, at the end of the seeding season. Maybe you've got peas in the bin, maybe you've got barley. Uh, you can cheapen that uh, mix by, uh, by using bin run seed uh, as long as it's clean and won't introduce other weeds to the, to the ground. Uh, use up some of that stuff so it's not sitting around and then maybe buy what you need to supplement that. You know, what, what is the time of year you're going to seed this? Uh, if it was prevented planting, you have basically all summer long to uh, get this growing. Yes, test, test, test. And test. Uh, as soon as it's uh, available. Uh, if, if you have a flooded out crop, such as my case, I'll show you some pictures in a little bit, then you have to wait until things dry down before you can get that going. You know, what are you going to choose? Uh, warm season versus cool season uh, uh, cover crops. Again, that cover crop chart will help you in those selections. You know, what's the seeding rate? Generally speaking, uh, we're seeding about half the commercial rate as you would when you uh, seed a, a crop for commercial production. Uh, plus, you're doing some blends out there. So, yes. you know, another thing to consider is pre-seeding uh, weed control. How are you going to do that? Uh, these crops aren't magic by any means. Uh, they, they need uh, elimination of competition. So be sure that uh, you uh, do some type of pre-seeding weed control, whether it's tillage or a chemical or something else. And also, what's your goal? Are, are you going to graze it or not? Are you using it to increase soil organic matter, or are you going to provide late season grazing? All those things will uh, be a consideration when you're uh, con looking at growing a cover crop. Good okay, uh, would, again yeah. on the handout, I got these uh, seed recipes, and I put up here, these are not gospel. Uh, these are just some thoughts that I put together of okay. different mixes and uh, what the cost would be. Again, the rates are about half the commercial rate and they're based on the costs I put together for 2010. And you can see as you look across there, I've got uh, all, 
you know, some mixes that are predominantly just a cool season recipe, some that are a mix of cool season yeah. and warm season, and yeah. again, yeah. depending right. on what time of the year you're going to get these crops growing, will be uh, dependent on uh, what mix you decide to put out there. Okay, let's take a look at that cover crop chart. So I'm going to minimize the uh, PowerPoint right now and go to that uh, USDA ARS cover crop chart. And there, an example of that is uh, on the back of that handout that I had, along with the website, if you want to download this thing. It's a, it's a pretty small file. It uh, runs in Adobe uh, format. So if you, uh, you can get Adobe for no charge on a computer, and you can download this from the uh, USDA ARS uh, Mandan site, and that site is printed for you on the handout. Uh, this is a really handy little uh, chart. All you have to do, it, it's set up like the periodic uh, chart, and all you really have to do is uh, go to the different selections and decide uh, which one you want to go with. But you see that the reason I like it, even just for a handout, is that it has uh, things broken down into, first of all, cool season on the left-hand side, uh, left hand to two-thirds of the way across. It's got all the crops broken down into cool seasons. Then it's got the warm season crops on the right one-third. It also has grasses on the right and the left columns. And then the broad leaves are in the center. Uh, we also have the legumes down there that are in the uh, brown squares and the blue squares in the case of the uh, warm season warm season crops. So all you really have to do to find out more is click on the various uh, crops to see what uh, they look like and then you can return but it gives some pretty good characteristics. So we'll just take a look here at uh, the turnip, the purple top turnip. Shows a picture of what they look like. Uh, basically breaks it down into what it is. Um, you know what the type of growth it is. It's a root crop of course, uh, high water use poor salinity tolerance. It has a seeding depth for you on there, a quarter to half an inch. This is a small seeded crop like canola, so you have to seed it shallow. Uh, pro crude protein content in the tops and the roots, uh, broken down. Uh, uh, talks about whether or not it uh, works with the mycorrhizae uh, fungus in the soil. So uh, all those things. And all you have to do to return to the main chart is hit the back to the uh, chart. And uh, let's go take a look at uh, radish. Uh, here's, uh, here's the uh, radish that will break up uh, soil uh, clay pans. And um, again, it's uh, in the same family as a purple top turnip and uh, produces a big taproot. But my observations over this past summer is that if you're going to take the advantage of uh, a large taprooted uh, crop like this radish, you have to get it seeded early enough in the summer so that it develops full growth. We had 30 inch tall. Uh, radish plants, which I'll show some pictures here in a little bit, uh, growing in the county that were seeded in, in early August, but yet the taproot only got to be about a foot long and about three-quarter inch in diameter. So it looks to me like uh, in order to get the large taproot system, you'd have to get this one going in uh, June sometime, or at least by the 1st of July, so that you can get advantage of uh, breaking up soil clay pans and maybe bringing up some deep nutrients. So we'll go back and look at a couple more here. Uh, let's just choose... Uh, Oh, lupin, one of the uh, cool season, uh, or lentil, uh, one of the cool season uh, um, uh, legumes, and of course that one will fix back, back or will fix nitrogen in the soil. Again, a little bit deeper, uh, deeper seeding depth. Uh, it'll work there. Okay, we'll go back. Let's choose a warm season broadleaf uh, amaranth over here. That's what amaranth looks like, relative of the uh, red root pigweed. Uh, it will work uh, in these uh, situations. Uh, again, uh, many different species. It's a low water user, but w will grow in the warm part of the season. Uh, tolerant to heat and drought. Seeding depth is deeper. Crude protein okay. Uh, you know, again, does not work with the mycorrhizae soil fungus. And we'll take a look at one more, and then we'll get out of this one. Uh, let's just take a look at uh, pearl millet. Would be an example of a warm season grass here. Uh, again, uh, very tall growth, very similar to uh, Sudan grasses. Um, upright plant architecture, low water use again, poor salinity tolerance. Uh, again, you can see it a little bit deeper than some of these other ones. Uh, basically kind of average protein. But this one does work with the uh, soil mycorrhizal uh, populations to, uh, to help work with that. So real handy chart for anybody to use. And uh, even if you just have the handout, it's something that will... Uh, 
be useful, I think, to uh, producers in helping form their opinions. But if you have a computer and have access to the Internet, you can download it, no charge, from the ARS uh, site. Okay, any questions on that? Comments? Tim, this is Carl at Carrington. Are you presenting the screw, the uh, the pictures up on the screen, or, or are yeah. we supposed to be doing it here? Oh, you're supposed to be doing it there unless you can zoom okay. the camera onto my screen. That has worked before, but that's why I sent the PowerPoint. Okay, out. gotcha. We have handouts here, so that's not a problem. Okay, good enough. But uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna close out this cover crop chart now, and I'll go back to my PowerPoint. And we'll be starting on slide 10. And we can go to the full screen now, because we'll start with some uh, with some pictures. For you, there is the CD with, okay. in case you wanted to look at it. Okay. Definitely. Everybody get there? Okay, uh, on slide 10 here, do you want to see this next season? These are some pictures I took of, uh, of uh, my farm after the June rains. Uh, of uh, last summer and uh, I've got about 70 acres of cropland that I crop on the home quarter uh, along with pasture and that yeah, sort of thing and this last year I seeded about one half that. corn and uh, one half uh, flax and by the time we got to the end of the May this is what it looked like I, I had about 50 percent flooding on those acres so uh, if we don't utilize this excessive moisture uh, we're going to have the same problem the next season and of course with the snowpack out there the way it is uh, right now in most of the state if you were relatively soaked up going into fall freeze up you can certainly have uh, some problems this next year okay so uh, you know what did what did uh, I decided with the cattle and that sort of thing and with fairly sizable acres of uh, failed crop that uh, I need to do something with it so I had to wait until about the first of August uh, before I could uh, get in and, and uh, do something with these spots. Uh, and again, it was about, you know, 25 uh, acres out of the, 25 to 30 acres out of the 70 acres. So I got in there and uh, got those cleaned up, uh, got them ready to do some planting. Um, what I just decided to do is uh, mix my own uh, mix. So I got a hold of some oat seed, bought some uh, turnips and radish, uh, kind of a simple mix. And I just set it up uh, in the hopper wagon with the oats and uh, blended in uh, turnips and radish seed uh, out of the bag and uh, going into the auger of my little uh, air seeder there. And uh, of course, the uh, guys that are more advanced in their farming can laugh at my antique equipment, but uh, I guess it works. So uh, uh, that's all I did is I kind of scooped the, uh, the uh, radish and the turnip uh, together a uh, pound and a half of each uh, per acre with uh, 30 pounds or about a bushel of oats and my costs end up being 13.35 an acre okay so uh, we had some problems with uh, moisture um, I, my goal was to get this seeded by the 15th of August but uh, uh, between uh, August 1st and uh, the 10th uh, you know I'd gotten it uh, worked up and uh, then we had more rains and we had, to, we had to go back in there with Roundup and uh, spray down the volunteer uh, weeds again. And uh, it got to be late August before I got this uh, seeding in there. But uh, you want to seed this stuff shallow. Uh, when, you're, when you're thinking of uh, radish and turnips and those types of crops, you're basically dealing with a canola seed. And uh, that needs to go in uh, about a half an inch deep. And the oats, and uh, if you deal with some of those crops, of course, if we just get those into moisture, whether they're shallow or deep, they're going to grow pretty well. So uh, we got them seeded the 27th of August. Uh, by the 7th of uh, September, next slide, uh, here we've got the pictures of uh, emergence of the crop uh, starting to come up pretty good. Uh, uh, we, of course, got some more rains uh, uh, on this after we got it seeded, so it was just absolutely perfect uh, growing conditions for, for these cover crops. And uh, uh, up comes the uh, radishes and turnips along with the oat seed. Uh, good emergence of September 7th. Okay, uh, this is a picture on October 1st of uh, the stages. You can see there we've got about two or three uh, inch uh, oats. And uh, by this time you can start to di differentiate between the uh, radishes and the turnips. The radish will have uh, scalloped leaves along the margins where the turnips will have more of a rounded leaf and more resemble canola. So uh, we'll take a look at those, but 
Uh, both of them, uh, you know, the mix was pretty good. The, uh, the population was pretty good, as you can see, uh, by the 1st of October. Here's a little bit more of a close-up on October 1st, and here's a good example right in the center of the screen. We've got the scallop leaf, and we've got the radish out there. This is a Pasha radish hybrid. And uh, then right next to it is more of a rounded leaf. Again, it more resembles uh, either tame mustard or tame canola. Uh, you can see there, uh, that would be the, uh, the uh, purple top turnip. Okay. Uh, what about uh, some cooperators in the county that also tried this? What were their results? Uh, we had a cooperator by the name of Glenn Cunningham out at Lansford, and uh, he had prevented planting uh, right next to his farm. He runs, uh, uh, you know, an average uh, herd of cattle for this part of the country, and uh, he seeded uh, earlier than I did, August 3rd. Uh, he had about 40, 45 acres next to the place. Uh, he had a custom blend put together by a seed company that he deals with, the local uh, elevator. Uh, it was 25% oats, 25% millet, 19% peas, 16% barley, 9% turnips, and 6% radish. Uh, seed cost per acre for him was 22.65, so another, basically about another $10 per acre than what it cost me to blend my own. Uh, he went ahead and uh, grazed the cows after November 1st. Uh, his uh, comments were the herd adapted quickly, uh, no digestive upset on that mix out there, and actually his calves uh, reduced creep feed consumption while they're out on the uh, cover crop. So next slide shows uh, what that looks like. You can see a really lush stand here. This was, uh, uh, you know, way past my knees. It was at least 30 inches tall. Uh, you can see uh, in there the white uh, flowering uh, radishes in the background, and uh, in the foreground you can see uh, some of the uh, purple top turnips, and of course there's the barley and the millet mixed in there. Uh, just a really lush uh, looking crop. This was uh, October 14th. Here's a little bit of a close up on the Cunningham's operation. Uh, you can see in there, and, and actually it wasn't in the seed mix, but right in the center we've got a, a lentil growing in there. And then we've got the radishes and turnips there in the, in the uh, background, but uh, that wasn't supposed to be in there, but I assume that the seed company had uh, an extra bucket of lentil, so they probably just threw it in the mix uh, just to clean things up. Here's a, a, a close-up of the turnips and radishes on October 14th. Again, uh, seeded August 3rd. Uh, you can see uh, the turnip is about uh, uh, the size of a golf ball, a little bit larger, more, more like a tennis ball. And then the radish has about a three-quarter inch uh, top on it and about uh, you know eight to ten inches long. Uh, so, again, if a guy's going to capitalize on the deep taprooted uh, cover crops, I think we need to get an earlier start than August 3rd, and certainly uh, July 1st would be a goal, maybe even the 20th of June. And so that would be on prevented, type, uh, prevented planting type acres or uh, something that you could get in relatively early, even if you dedicate a, a field for that. Okay, uh, another cooperative we had was uh, a young uh, cattle uh, crops guy by the name of Pat Flaherty out at West Ope. And again, he had prevented planting. Uh, again, this was right next to his place. And he seeded a mix on July 26th. And uh, he, again, just uh, took uh, and pretty much blended up his own. He had on hand uh, bin run confectionery sunflowers, uh, Arvika peas, and then he bought millet, uh, turnips, and radish. Uh, I didn't get the cost from him, but uh, you could refer to the charts for, uh, for that. Uh, he turned the herd out on November 1st again and uh, was back there on November 17th and took pictures and uh, it was green, grazed clean off. Uh, again, uh, a pr pretty good sized acreage next to the place, but the cattle utilized it all and, and they even grazed the roots of the uh, turnips and the radishes right down to the soil surface. When I was out there on the 14th of November, uh, all you saw was the top, the bottom half of the turnips, just a white ring in the soil. And uh, both producers will incorporate this into their system as an annual forage management tool, whether they have, uh, 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 you know, cover crops or, or uh, not, or whether they have prevented planting or not. So this is a picture of Pat Flaherty's on October 12th. Uh, again, a very tall growth. We're looking at probably 30 uh, to 35 inch tall uh, cover crop out there. Again, the white flowering radishes in the foreground. You can see peas mixed in there. He was relatively heavy on the peas compared to the Cunninghams. Uh, this is a little bit more of a close-up. It shows, uh, if you can see, see down in there, you've got the uh, purple top radish uh, sticking out of the ground. 
but this is relatively heavy soil and you can see that those radishes and uh, turnips were uh, you know loosening up the soil and and getting things to uh, to uh, you know really separate there this shows uh, next slide here uh, shows a mixture of peas in there uh, radishes uh, turnips and that sort of thing uh, this is a picture of uh, Pat Flaherty's uh, root crops. Again, uh, we've got about a tennis ball sized uh, turnip on there. And then we've got uh, actually a radish that is about three quarter inch on top and a little bit shorter than it was on Cunningham's uh, simply because I'm sure there's plenty of moisture there and the soil's a little bit heavier than over at the Lansford site. Okay, uh, back to uh, my farm. Uh, how, did I, how did I pan out? Uh, Growing period was basically over by the 21st of October. We'd had enough, um, you know, hard frost by that time that you could see even the uh, the radishes and turnips, which are uh, pretty well uh, uh, frost hardy, uh, starting to slow up. And uh, so I didn't have that much growth out there. We had uh, about six to eight inches total growth. Uh, so we didn't really get a measure on the total tonnage. Uh, a few comments here about uh, the, the salinity of uh, tolerance of these crops. Uh, this picture is uh, an area that is, uh, compared to the other area that I just showed, relatively salty, gives me problems. It's a saline uh, uh, alkali area, about two to three acres in size. And you can see that actually the turnips and the radishes didn't do well at all in this area. In fact, they, it killed them out. Uh, you can see on the ring around the outside where there was less flooding, and uh, salinity that the oats survived, but very little growth out there. So if I want to do something with the uh, crops, uh, cover crops in this area, I might want to consider sugar beet or sunflowers or something that will actually do fairly, fairly well on the, uh, on the flooded and saline areas. So uh, if, if that's your problem, uh, the, uh, the uh, turnips and radishes aren't going to do very well for you. Even small grains won't. Okay, this is just a shot here on October 24th. Uh, again, it shows the, uh, the radishes and turnips mixed with the oats. You've got kind of yellowing leaves on there, which means they've had about all the frost they can take. So there really wasn't any reason to let it grow any longer and uh, let the herd pretty well uh, uh, take and, and utilize what they could. This just shows a shot of the overall growth out there, uh, 8 to 10 inch tall with the oats uh, and the radishes and the uh, turnips. And so that's about all we got. And again, if I did it another year, I would certainly try to get it going earlier than I did. Okay, and then uh, finally, this is a shot of uh, the two uh, root crops on, on my uh, acreage that was seeded August 27th. You can see here that we've got uh, a root on the radish only about, uh, you know, again, three-quarter inch in diameters or the, the turnip. Uh, didn't penetrate very far, only about uh, three to four inches uh, down, and the radish is only about uh, half an inch in diameter and about six uh, inches long. So we utilized some moisture out there, but uh, and provided some forage and grazing. The cattle absolutely loved it. They cleaned that off first before they uh, grazed in the corn, and uh, and uh, that that's the way it went. So that's my experiences. I guess uh, on cover crops, I think they really have a fit. Uh, for both a diversified uh, uh, cattle and grain operation as well as just a, a cattle operation. I think uh, there's definitely some uh, uh, use for them out there. You can save costs by blending your own seed. Uh, if you want the best seed source, you probably want to get uh, something blended up by, by a seed dealer. So with that, I think that is uh, it. Yes, uh, I've got some stuff on relay crops here, but we're going to let uh, Ezra cover that from the Carrington Center. So. With that, I guess I would uh, ask if there's any questions from the group and uh, turn it back to Carl.